uh, Tamil Tigris. Sydney writer Naromi de Souza writes about the early years as the hostilities were building and then details what it was like to live through and to participate in the civil war as a teenage Tamil tiger. Her account is an honest reflection of the allure of the tigers, the capacity of a young woman to see some things clearly, but also to deny some things, and the emotional upheavals that accompany both the thrill and the trauma of war. Naromi's book uh, tells the story of a tragedy, really, as does, as does Francis Harrison's. Francis is a uh, foreign correspondent who's worked for the BBC in various parts of the world, including from 2000 to 2004 as the resident correspondent in Sri Lanka. Francis's um, book, Still Counting the Dead, in Francis's book we fast forward uh, two decades from, from Naromi's work. Uh, and then learn about the final days or the final months of, of, uh, of the, the, the bitter civil war. The Tamil Tigers, which once controlled large swathes of the small island, uh, on the, are on the brink of defeat. And the Sri Lankan government forces are gunning for total victory. What eventuates is a, a bloodbath. Um, countless Tamil civilians are killed, deliberately and needlessly. The, the extent of human suffering is actually mind-blowing. Um, and I think we'll hear a bit, a bit more later about it's even greater in some ways than what Frances was able to document in, in her book. Frances' book situates uh, itself with the victim and it calls to account not only the Sri Lankan government um, but also the Tamil Tigers who, while espousing liberation for the Tamil people, treated them also with murderous disdain. Both books, I think, are devastating reads uh, and raise serious questions, not only about the things that happened in Sri Lanka. They're essays, I think, in the reality of war. They speak of the human capacity for brutality um, and about the brutalising effects of that. They also raise questions, I think, about the international community's interest in uh, and commitment to human rights, and particularly uh, those issues in an age of global terrorism. So, um, welcome to you both. Thank you. Thanks, David. I, I wonder whether we should start at the beginning, um, and that's uh, with you, Naomi. I wonder um, whether you might tell us something about the Tamils in Sri Lanka um, and about why some of them, at least, have, have felt the need to take up arms. Maybe you can read something as well. Um, thanks, David. Um, thank you all for giving up your time and come to listen to us. Um, you know, because Sri Lanka is a small place and not many people know about it or even interested. But um, I do appreciate that you all come to um, learn something or just confirm something today. Um, well, Tamils are a minority in Sri Lanka, so it's a struggle between minority and majority Sinhalese. Um, I grew up in a very ordinary family. Um, I was born in the south where it's a majority Sinhalese. I was not born in the north where it's um, the Tamil stronghold as they'd call it. Um, and I had a very normal childhood which I thought was quite wonderful actually because um, we had, um, my parents were of sort of mixed heritage because my dad is from the north, he's a Tamil and my mum's also a Tamil but she was, she had Indian heritage. Um, and you know, we had lots of Sinhalese friends. We grew up in a um, fairly normal environment until I started to realize something wasn't right. And in 1977, I think there was um, some upheaval, which I was very, very young to understand. And my parents made a fatal decision to send us to Jaffna um, so that we will be safer, which is a Tamil um, stronghold. So once I was there, it seemed normal, although I didn't particularly warm up to the place. It was very hot, like today, all the time. But, um, you know, the, it was a very stifling environment. But, um, you know, I got on and suddenly started to realize things were not so normal. And as a very bookish child, I was quite shocked into reality in, um, when I was about 13 years old. The state library was burned down by the government forces. And to me, that was just the turning point, I think, for a young child to see something, you know, like that um, to happen, because 
a library. Why would somebody burn down a library? And to me, it was a symbol of oppression. It was a Tamil, um, an ancient library that had lots of ancient Tamil um, literature. And then I started to realize that things were different, that I needed to understand this a bit more. But then, you know, being a child, you just carry on with your normal self. And 1983, everything changed because not far from where I was, um, the Tamil Tigers, I used to think they were bank robbers or something like that, mm -hmm. until um, they um, ambushed an army patrol and killed 13 soldiers, which had a huge impact um, for the whole country. Um, because the entire Tamil population, um, not just in Jaffna, but all through the country, suffered for it. Um, there was an anti-Tamil pogrom, and since then, refugees had started to flood to um, all around the world. And to me, one of the things I find it surprising to this day that the countries were accepting refugees, so they obviously knew there was something wrong, that these people were suffering persecution, and yet nobody did anything. Um, so one way they're accepting, yep, you, there is problems in Sri Lanka. In other ways, everything, you know, they carried on as it didn't happen outside. So, um, you know, and things just got worse for us. You know, gradually civil war broke out and my normal going to school day every day, things, we didn't have school much. And then there was art, random artillery shelling and the tigers became strong because after 83, a lot of young men went and joined the tigers. Um, because they just thought that was the only way to do it. But not women, because at that time, you know, they were politically involved, but in a society like Sri Lanka, women are fairly conservative, or we are expected to be. So, you know, it wasn't a thing that would just go up and pick up a gun and start fighting. But by the time I was 16, things just got so bad that I spent a lot of time in the bunkers. There were home-built bunkers, but I was still studying for my school exams, thinking, well, just in case there was an exam, I don't want to miss out, you know, I needed to keep, keep at it. So um, I was fairly studious, as most Tamil children are expected to, you all have to become doctors. Can I just um, you? Sorry. I, I'm wondering if you, if, you know, I, I'm wondering if, if the audience actually understands what it was like to, to grow up. What, what did you see and feel as a, as a child in that period? Well, Initially, it seemed like things were happening to other people um, in a distant place because you could hear gunshots, you heard um, artillery shell dropping close to the um, perimeters of an army camp. And then gradually, as um, army would gain territory, the shells started to fall everywhere and then the army would go on patrols and um, you know, people would be taken out of their homes, um, shot, um, young children. And, and I think I started to get a bit scared. I thought, well, they could just walk into my house and murder my whole family and rape us, because that was something that we expected. They expected to be raped as young women. And so I started to get really scared and gradually, you know, I was to, I mean, you'll see it in the early parts of the book. I will constantly try and eavesdrop into conversations of the adults, because nobody will answer us. You know, in Sri Lanka, it's one of those things that children don't question um, authority or adults. And so if I say, they'll say, just go do your homework, you know, that sort of thing. So, um, and I could see that they were scared and they were helpless and they didn't know what to do themselves. And I think that started um, a complete um, change in my attitude, thinking that maybe we all have to do something for ourselves because you can't rely on other people. No one's going to save us because we, we could see the international community wasn't going to come in um, to save us. So I thought, well, it looks like I'm going to die. I'd rather do something and die than just be dead in a bunker as nobody. So, um, I'm sorry. Sure. Maybe I'll ask Francis something. So, the situation was was awful for Tamils. Uh, it, we're talking about the, the, the 1980s here. And then a couple of decades later, you go to Sri Lanka. What was happening then? Well, when I lived in Sri Lanka, when I first went, there was full-scale war. But um, the Tigers, by that stage, had actually gained territory. They moved on from being a sort of guerrilla movement at the time when Naomi was with them to actually controlling a large portion of the north and the east of the island and running effectively a de facto state. They had their own police, their own court system, their own administration, they took taxes from people. So they ran a, a small state of their own. And they were still at war, so around the boundaries there, were, there was fighting, but um, there was a kind of territory that they controlled in um, the northeast of Sri Lanka. 
And when I went there, the, most of the time when I lived in Sri Lanka, I was a BBC correspondent, I was based in Colombo, there was a peace process, which meant that actually for the first time, you know, journalists from the south could go and see the tigers, you know, interact with them, meet them, get to know them. And so that's what I spent most of those three years of the peace process doing. And I found, I found it fascinating, I mean, to, to see, you know, how they operated, because reporting on them long distance was really frustrating, and, you know, you would write about them every day without actually ever seeing a tiger, except in London or Paris. So, I mean, when I first went to the Vani, the area that they controlled, it was like going to the moon, you know, for me. It was so different from the south. I mean, there is, a, there is poverty in the south of Sri Lanka, but nothing on the scale of what there was there, because the government controlled the area, the perimeter of the area, and so didn't allow medicine, food, you didn't allow things into that area. They had a strict economic embargo. So you went in and you found children sitting on ammunition boxes, studying in schools where there were no windows, but shell holes everywhere and bullet marks everywhere. And you went to the hospital and you found people who lost limbs, you know, doing because of landmines. And you met the demining team and you found that they were doing it with a metal fork, the demining, you know, it was so unhigh tech, it was shocking. And um, the doctors didn't have enough medicines. You know, it was, it was uh, poverty on an appalling scale. It would take you hours and hours and hours on these appalling bump, bumpy roads even to get to the main town. There were no hotels, there were no restaurants. It was completely you know, underdeveloped. And different from what you would have expected? So you know, the, the difference between reporting on a place from distance and then being able to get in, into that place? Yes, I mean, it's difficult to explain, but um, it was quite different. I just didn't know what it would look like physically, what the level of, of um, facilities would be, how friendly the tigers would be to us. You know, we had no idea until we went there. And then um, the book is actually not about that period. The book is about uh, some years later mm -hmm. as the, the war escalates, really. That's right. Well, I mean, I watched the very end of the war from London, and you know, I thought I'd finished with Sri Lanka and put it to bed, as it were. I went on to another story. I went to Iran, but I couldn't kind of get away from it in London because, first of all, a lot of Sri Lankan journalists turned up in in exile. People I'd been in press conferences with and knew and wanted help in London, and from them I understood that there was still something kind of ongoing that was pretty awful. And then I also talked to one of the senior tigers right through the end of the war on Skype and satellite phones and so on, which was quite rare. They didn't have that much contact with the which outside you world. Yeah. Which I talk about. And so I was connected again to the story in a way. I couldn't get away from it. And what I understood at the time was that something really awful had happened. I knew that from watching the videos that came out, some of the news coverage, from talking to people. And then, of course, when everybody came out of the war and, and the survivors, and they were all put in a massive detention center, a huge refugee camp, I mean, the second biggest city in Sri Lanka at the time, it was so huge. I knew that something awful was happening there. I mean, you got reports that women were being abused, that people were disappearing, and I knew enough to know that something rather sinister was happening. But until I started to research this book, I had no idea how dreadful it was. You know, it was only when I sat down with the first survivor from this war in London and talked to her for days on end that I began to understand quite how shocking it was. And the first interview, I thought, wow, I found this amazing story, you know, so shocking. And then the next one was worse, and the next one the same. And basically, after a while, I realized that anybody you spoke to who'd come out of this war had a tale of survival that was extraordinary. I mean, it was a bit, for me, it felt a bit like talking to Holocaust survivors, except that nobody even knew that this had happened or acknowledged it. 